Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Tuesday. Glad you're with us. Awesome, fantastic show planned for you today. Uh, listen, we, we got a great week. As I look out ahead, of, we're hammering themes this week, and we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. I'm not done uh, with the Mo Montgomery Riverboat brawl, the Montgomery Riverboat melee. I'm not done with that. I'm going to bring Royce White into our conversation uh, about that because I think there are some larger things to read into uh, what went on in Montgomery, and we're going to do that today. Steve Kim is going to join us. We'll talk a little sports uh, with Steve Kim. Very interesting story going on with Eric B. Enemy, uh, the new Washington Commanders offensive coordinator, the toast of NFL coaching, the greatest black coach in the history of America. Uh, interesting story that we'll, we'll get into Steve Kim uh, uh, with that about. <clears throat> we'll also talk about uh, a broadcaster for the Baltimore Orioles that was fired for acknowledging that the team was struggling. It's an inc incredible story. But we're going to start and spend uh, the majority of this show back on Montgomery because I think it's important. Before I, I got an awesome fire starter that's going to open up this conversation and provide you a bigger lens to see this event through. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, our purpose on this show, one of our primary sponsors on this show. You guys know I love Preborn, and I want you guys to love Preborn because Preborn supports our worldview, our view that life begins at conception. And that's about a mindset that life begins inside the womb, and that drives our behavior when the baby comes outside the womb, and it drives our life perspective, that God knitted us inside the womb. And so if you really want to know how to treat life outside the womb, that starts with treating life properly inside the womb. No one does that better than preborn. They provide expectant mothers who are considering an abortion. They can provide them an ultrasound, introduce that baby's heartbeat and image of the baby to that expected mother, and she is far more likely to choose life, and that's when preborn really steps in and provides her with the resources and the materials she needs to get through the pregnancy and in the first two years of that baby's life. Dan Steiner, the founder of preborn, has been on this show. I've spent time with him. We know that the money we send to preborn actually pays for ultrasounds and not mid-level executives on you know six-figure salaries. This money that you send, that we send to support preborn, does exactly what we say it does. It pays for ultrasounds and it pays to help those women through the pregnancy and through the early years of that baby's life. Preborn has saved more than a quarter of a million babies. We're going to save 50,000 babies. You, me, us, the Fearless Show, Blaze Media. We're going to do that by supporting preborn. It's very easy. Uh, pound 250, say the keyword baby. Then you'll get some prompts and instructed on how to give. Or you can do it the, the way I like to do it, preborn.com slash Jason. Guys, this is important for us, for fearless soldiers. This is important about our, our worldview. Support preborn. Support life inside the womb. Adopt the mindset and the belief, because it's biblical, that life begins at conception. Uh, when you do this, when you support preborn, I love it when you send me emails. It keeps me motivated. It inspires me. It inspires this show. It lets us know we're having an impact. So if you could email me, fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com, I would appreciate it. All right. Taking care of preborn. Now I want to further take care of you by making this show as fascinating and putting you well ahead of the conversation of everybody else that you can be the smartest person at your dinner party this weekend or dinner, business dinner uh, this week. Uh, let's get right uh, to our fire starter. <clears throat> the social media race soldiers celebrating the Montgomery melee should read General Smedley Butler's book, War is a Racket. Published in 1935, the book spells out the fraudulence of war. A decorated hero, Butler explained the financial rewards of manufactured mass conflict 
for business elites. Smedley wrote, quote, only a small inside group knows what war is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. In modern America, the corporate elite and their tech partners are working to promote, to promote a race war, a conflict among working class Americans of all colors. Reaction to the Montgomery Riverboat melee feels like a reenactment of the Battle of Fort Sumter. An 1861 skirmish led by a South Carolina militia group that precursored the Civil War. The quick surrender of the United States Army at Fort Sumter emboldened the Confederates, helping them believe the North did not have the stomach for war. In Montgomery on Saturday, Two white drunken idiots attacked a black security guard who seemingly unfastened their pontoon boat from the dock. At one point, the black security guard was surrounded by a half dozen white people. Half of them appeared to be trying to stop the fight. The other half appeared to be assaulting the security guard. Eventually, a swarm of black onlookers rescued the security guard and then proceeded to escalate the conflict. The videos of the skirmish are spread across all of social media. The social media collective referred to as Black Twitter is celebrating the one-sided skirmish as a sign of black unity and strength. The truth is, reaction to the brawl is a sign of America's dysfunction, unwillingness to learn from history, and inability to properly identify its true enemy. Race war is a racket a scheme that benefits a handful of elites and the puppets they pay to foment racial conflict. The combatants in Montgomery are natural allies. They're pawns in a plot to distract the masses from recognizing, addressing, and undermining the elites exploiting their ignorance. The initial conflict in Montgomery is not rare. Fights between patrons and security guards are commonplace. Men struggle bowing to authority, especially in environments rife with alcohol. Normally, these conflicts do not make national news or trend over social media. The Montgomery incident would not be interesting if the security guard and his initial attackers were of the same race. It would just be men behaving badly, another piece of content for world star hip hop. I'll give you an example. A week ago, 10 men in Los Angeles bludgeoned a security guard to death. No one tried to rescue the security guard. Onlookers fled. Take a listen to this, I think, KTLA news report. Uh, Pedro and Lauren, they say what was crucial here was speaking to the eyewitnesses from the club, but they say that a lot of people, when they saw that fight escalate, saw the violence happen, that a lot of people fled, left the area, went home, and they say if anyone saw something, knows something about this incident, to contact them immediately. Reporting live, I'll send it back to you both in the studios. That, that's why we say if you see something, say something. Thank you, Andy Rose. So I, I said this yesterday. And I'm sure some people were upset because some of our regular viewers, I, I was in the chat last night, I was reading the comments yesterday and today. Some of you are caught up in this race war and you've picked sides based on race and, and you can't see the bigger picture and you're upset about my point of view and perspective on this. I am not remotely backing down. What I said yesterday is true. If the combatants in Montgomery had all been of the same color, particularly black, everybody would flee. And no one would have any information for the cops. I just showed you what happened a week ago. Black security guard bludgeoned by black men. Everybody fled. No one saw anything. No one's helping the cops. This goes on all the time. What made Montgomery interesting is that the security guard was black and his initial attackers were white. Social media, particularly Twitter, has programmed many Americans to interpret the world through racial lenses. That's being woke. All interaction between men and women of different races is potentially racist, especially if any of the engagement is negative toward the black person. 
The white men are not just drunken idiots, they're racist drunken idiots. There's thousands of years of history showing that men are drunken idiots regardless of race. But that doesn't matter. At the behest of the elites who control corporate and social media, all engagement between different races must be interpreted through a racial prism. Why? Who benefits? The elites the global millionaires and billionaires and the influencers they control. They want the black security guard to believe that the white landscaper is their mortal enemy, the man behind a plot to deny black progress. The elites want the white landscaper to believe the black security guard is the man living off government giveaways and driving higher taxes. Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell are the enemy of the average working man, regardless of color. Pelosi and McConnell take their orders from George Soros, the Rothschild family, Klaus Schwab, and Bill Gates. Barack and Michelle Obama, Al Sharpton, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Maddow, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are bought and paid for influencers hired to convince the working class that the political celebrity and financial elite are working to improve the life of the working man. <laughs> it's laughable. Joe Biden wants you to believe the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers are the biggest threat to national security. Our politicians sell obvious lies because we believe obvious lies. Just remember, an Arab man in a cave 5,000 miles away brought down the World Trade Center towers in Building 7. So of course, white men in rural militias are undermining the safety and progress of black men in Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Los Angeles. It all makes sense, don't you see? Race war is a racket. It might be the greatest racket ever invented. It blinds people to obvious truth. It's turned allies into enemies. Black people think a group of angry working class white people confronting corrupt politicians at the Capitol was a racist insurrection. We think beating up a tiny group of white drunk idiots on a pier is a sign of progress and unity. Anyone celebrating the Montgomery melee is under MK Ultra control. Big tech social media apps have disconnected them from reality and common sense. They're mindless race soldiers willing to sacrifice their freedom and agency in a race war that will in no way benefit them. They're cowards and sellouts, unwilling to confront our real enemies. Our idols are our enemies and our enemies are our allies. That is my fire starter. And that's why we're having uh, Royce White on to uh, come on and mostly, I, I'm predicting, I haven't talked to Royce, but you know, Royce is too classy and too smart to, to do it, but he should just come on and say, I told you so. Y'all wanna get in the comments and chats and, 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 and say uh, double cross and triple cross and three card Monty and, and you know, mimic Royce White. Y'all wanna, you know, when Royce talks about you'd rather jerk off and blah, 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 and not deal with reality, this is what he's talking about. Now I'm speculating, because I haven't talked to Royce yet, but we'll have him on. And when I was writing this, thinking about this, Thinking about today's show, all I kept thinking was, was Royce and the double cross and the triple cross and the three card money and, the, and the, the shell game that's being played and the pitting of people that should be allies. Again, when I told y'all yesterday, this whole Montgomery thing makes me sad. This is what I was talking about. This is what I was feeling. Took me a little extra time to put it in writing and to fully flesh out my thoughts. But I'm looking at people that should be allies, that have been pitted against each other by media corporations and social media influencers, and we've been programmed to see each other as enemies. When we're all being played, all of us, 
And, and tr do I know that the two drunken idiots that started the fight were in the wrong? Absolutely. But that's just men being men, idiots, particularly when I suspect alcohol was involved. I don't, and those two white guys may be bigots, but I don't think that's what was at the root or at the heart of this situation. I think they would have jumped on a white security guard if they had unfastened their pontoon and they were liquored up and they would do something stupid. You, you see it all the time. We pretend like white dudes don't fight, that they don't have disputes with authority. They do. And so to me, this conflict wasn't racial. Now, have we been programmed to see it as racial? And that's why people are over social media cheering for it and, and calling it some form of progress and sending out memes and celebrating and everybody's getting a good laugh. And some of the stuff is funny, I admit. Like someone put out something with a chair and, you know, try that in a small town. I mean, I laughed hysterically when I just even heard about it. But the reality is working class people, the kind of people that got in that fight on that pier in Montgomery, Alabama, they should be allies. Their anger, the people that they should recognize as their enemy, and I'm talking about real enemy, the people exploiting them. They have big political offices. They have multi-million dollar TV contracts. They're billionaires manipulating everyone for, the, for conflict so that they can profit, so that you're so focused on seeing them and, and your peers as your enemy that you don't see the real people exploiting you. Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, the Obamas, Joe Biden. And this cuts across, Mitch McConnell, this isn't, for me, this isn't some political right-wing, left-wing thing. This is the political celebrity elite and, and, and they're billionaires, and, 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 and we'll get into it later in the week. BlackRock and all, all the things they've done to rig up the system so that you can't advance, and so you'll give up your freedom and agency, so that eventually you'll give up your guns, and so that eventually you'll eat bugs and own nothing and be happy. They got you tied up in this racial conflict while they pull off the greatest okie doke in the history of mankind. And y'all wanna argue and bicker in the chat about a race war and uh, who <clears throat> you, you selling out black people or blah, blah. Stop it, man. You, you, some of you, I, I just quite frankly, I'm like, you're retarded. The, the Christian in me, just says, okay, I know they're retarded, but I'm going to remain on their side and try to explain to things to them so that they snap out of it. It's, it's pure sympathy on my part. And it, it's, it's just, it's what God compels me to do, is to not turn angry towards you that you've been fooled because you're a victim. You've been brainwashed, television, all of, the, all of the tools that they've used. And again, I, I'm not saying I'm better than you. I've just been inside the media machine and see how it operates. And, and luckily my grandmother in 25th Street Baptist Church planted something in me when I was so young, I can't escape it. I cannot sell out. I'm not gonna sell out working people. I don't care how much money they offer me. And that's why they've quit offering me money because they know I can't be bought. And that's not me bragging, because it's not me. I, I'm as degenerate and as debaucherous as all the rest of them. But I'm afraid of God. I fear God more than I fear them, and more than I want to give in to my debaucherous tendencies. So uh, we'll bring on Royce White to take another victory lap as he is prone to do on this show. 
uh, <laughs> before I do that, I want to tell you guys about Samaritan Ministries. Tired of someone else telling you where to go when you have a medical need? Are you ready to take control of your health care? Samaritan Ministries could be the solution you're looking for. They connect hundreds of thousands of Christians across the nation who come together through prayer, encouragement, and financial support when a medical need arises. It's not insurance, and you're not limited by restrictive networks. Say you have a medical need. You don't have to check and see what hospital is in your network or be concerned about the doctor being in network too. No, you go to the hospital, you choose, and don't give a second thought as to what's in network and what's not because with Samaritan Ministries, you're in control of your health care. Afterwards, fellow members pray for you and send money directly to you to help you pay your medical bills. And when they have a medical need, you'll do the same for them. That's what biblical health care sharing looks like. Check it out today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash fearless. SamaritanMinistries.org slash fearless. All right, stick around. Royce White next. We don't want to go to heaven with freedom. It's my obligation to hate discrimination. Raising up your hands for freedom. All right, welcome back. Uh, let's roll out to Minneapolis. Uh, yeah, I think we're going out to Minneapolis. Royce is back in studio looking sharp. Uh, he's been on the road for a while, but Royce, as I was constructing my mono today, this morning, all I kept thinking about was Royce White and the double cross, the triple cross, the three card money, and all the things that people like to giggle about. And I'm like, this dude is totally right. They got us so confused about who our real enemies are, and they have the working class pitted against each other in this false dichotomy of this racial conflict that we can't see who our real enemies are. And so uh, I took a little victory lap for you. It's, it's well-deserved. Uh, if you want to take a victory lap yourself, <laughs> yourself but just I want you to elaborate and just further explain your narrative of, of the game that's being run on all of us and, and how they've pitted us in this false war while they run off with the green, as you say. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the biggest three card Monty is pit black versus white when you make, and, and, and then make off with the green. Uh, you know, first, first I wanna say I, I, I appreciate all the time you give me on this show. It's the, probably the best conversation happening on the internet, maybe the best conversation happening anywhere in the world, certainly on the internet, certainly in our movement. So I'm very appreciative of my time. I'm, I'm happy to be back in the studio. Um, thank you for the compliments. I, I don't I don't really want to take a victory lap. I, a lot of times I wake up in the morning praying that people prove me wrong. I think you would say the same thing when we have to be critical of people or culture. A lot of times we we just we we, we hope that people prove us wrong. We hope that they don't live up to, to some of the more pessimistic um, uh, uh, analysis that we have. This one's very simple, but it's not without huge consequence. And, and I think what I want people to understand the most or, or take the most from this or from my time on the show when I talk about the three-card Monty is America's importance and the overall prospect of freedom around the world. Like everybody else in the world is for sale right now. We're going through, we, we are going through a great reset. We are going through a global restructuring. We are going through a new world order. Nobody's shy about that. I think a lot of working class American citizens find that to be uh, an, an issue or a topic that's, you know, beyond them or beyond their, their concern or beyond their power. Uh, but but regardless, you may not believe in the Great Reset, but the Great Reset certainly believes in you. And it, it believes in black and white people and the, this, this narrative or this culture war between them more than anybody. Uh, because every other nation is for sale. The Saudis are for sale. The European Finocchios, they're for sale. We can't trust them. The, the other countries in Southeast Asia, our, our alliance with them hangs upon a thread. When China gets too strong, they'll roll over some of those countries like bowling pins. You'll, you're, it, it'll, it'll scare your head will spin how quick they'll, they'll betray any any uh, 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 trilateral commission uh, alliances that that still that still exist. Um, the real bastion of freedom is America. The real bastion of of nation 
constituted freedom is America. And if America is weak, we can't defend freedom and liberty here at home, first and foremost, let alone around the world, which is why we're struggling to figure out when it's morally right to defend freedom around the world. And the way to do that is to distract the working class through a race war. And they want to bring a race war about. And when I see the fight, when I see the fight, I think, here's a brawl, right? Here's a brawl, people getting drunk, it happens all the time. When I see the commentary about the fight, I know that the brainwashing is working. I know that people are looking at a, a good old fashioned brawl, a, a good old fashioned uh, bout of fisticuffs, and, and they're jumping on one side or the other based on skin color. And it's like, um, uh, first off, let's deal with my our community. Me and you take a lot of flack. Why? Because we're black and we criticize black people. The the status quo of the establishment is that no black people should be able to criticize any other black people, or you're basically helping out white people. This is a this is a mentality for your postmodern civil rights activist hijacked uh, uh, black bourgeois intellectuals. This is not for real hitters. This is not a worldview for real hitters. I don't care what political thing you subscribe to. If you can't clean up your own house, your own community, your own actions, your own look yourself in the mirror and deal with yourself first, you got a problem. You got a big problem. And I see a lot of black people doing I saw from the clip we posted the other day where I talked about being pro-black and going out and how you behave and it reflecting back on black people as a whole. Yeah, it's not fair. It's not even logical. Just because one black person act like that doesn't mean all black. We, we know that. Let's deal with things as they are. This is why, and this, this makes me emotional and passionate. This is why the liberal white establishment led by the white feminists and the white beta male cuck and the, the homosexuals, this is why the movement was better off with Martin Luther King than Malcolm X, respectfully. And now I know Martin changed his tune right towards the very end, but Malcolm's point was always much more oriented around why do we want to leave Harlem? Why don't we want to make Harlem a place where black people would want to live? We could talk about the white man. That's fine. But why are black people still stabbing each other at a higher rate in Harlem than they are out in, uh, you know, what is it, uh, uh, White Plains or, or wherever, you know, upstate New York or, or, or Long Island or wherever it is, right? Why are we still treating each other just as bad as we say they treat us, if not worse? And so black people got to deal with themselves first and foremost. Now, in dealing with ourselves, does that mean we should get beat on? No, no. So when I saw the fight, hey, white couple white guys trying to jump a black guy. Some black people came to his defense. There was more black people out there than white people from what it looked like. Um, and and you got a good old fight. In my opinion, I was happy that nobody was shot. When I heard nobody was shot and killed, because I'm from the neighborhood, because I'm from the streets, and when fights and physical altercations break out, usually gunfire follows. I was actually happy it was just a brawl, <laughs> if I'm honest, and nobody was killed. Um, but, but the reaction on both sides, black and white, I'm in the conservative movement. I'm seeing white conservatives respond. Oh, look at these black people. Look how savage they're acting. Guys, America's soft in all the wrong places. We are soft in all the wrong places. And then we're very effeminate. We're very feminized in all the wrong places. We live in a hyper intellectualized, but philosophically bankrupt society. Robbed of first principles, okay? Once you cross the threshold, and this is to speak about the fight. Once you cross the threshold of, once you break the seal of one-on-one -on -one combat, you're now in the law of unintended consequences, okay? So I don't care how many people joined in, how many people were there, if it was men versus women. Once you break the seal of individual one-on-one -on -one combat, you are now in the law of unintended consequences and anything could happen. That's why you should be slow to engage in physical combat. And once you do, you have to realize you, you make that choice. Anything can happen, right? I don't agree with the black guy who hit the woman over the head with the chair. I don't care what she said. I don't care what she did. She wasn't a threat enough, in my opinion, from watching the video to hit her over the head with the chair. But again, you're in the law of unintended consequence. I'm not making an excuse for it. Overall, it's a fight. Fights happen to cheer them on as though this is the symbol of the start of the race war that we've all been waiting for. We've all got our popcorn. We're all sitting in front of the TV waiting for the race war to break out. 
The race war is the biggest distraction in human history. They're going to chip you idiots up. They're going to chip you up. They're going to IRS the, the, the nation into, into absolute serfdom. You won't be able to walk down the street, make a right turn, and buy a candy bar at a corner store without the federal government knowing where and when you did it. And that is way more da- – I'm not worried about white supremacists. Liberal white women want me to be afraid of white supremacy. I'm just not that afraid of it. I mean, I, 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 I'm, no, I'm, I take that back, Jason. I'm sorry. I'm ranting. I'm afraid of Bill Gates' white supremacy. I'm not afraid of the KKK's white supremacy. In fact, if I really get back into the history, they're the same white supremacy. But what I'm saying is I'm not afraid of this caricature of the, the, the white conservative American hillbilly KKK member. I'm not afraid of him. I'm, first off, I'm not afraid of him because right now we have the same common enemy in, in many ways. And I'm not so sure that the person who they call a KKK hillbilly is actually a KKK hillbilly. But I know there are KKK members that are hillbillies and both things can be true. But we don't want both things to be true so we don't have to deal with the nuance of what's in front of us. And that's a real battle. There's a real battle about to take place and we are so poorly equipped to deal with it on a philosophical level, intellectually. White liberal women, for example, here in Minnesota, head of the teachers union, teaching all our young black kids, they want more money. They got a billion dollars in the Minneapolis public school system. They want more money, went on strike because they need more money. But the black kids can't read past the fifth grade level. But you want more money to teach us. And then you want to say the reason that you can't get through to the kids is because their parents aren't home. No, the reason you can't get through to the kids is because your Marxist professors at the universities spend more time teaching you about equity, environmental globalism than they do on how to actually connect with people. Right. So and and I say that to say this, these same liberal white women are running the movement. They're, They're running the propaganda. Their energy, their the spirit of the liberal white woman is running America. Be afraid of the KKK. They're on the loose. Cops are the KKK. Give up your guns and call the cops when the KKK shows up. And black men are following this shit. Pardon my language. Black people are falling right into it. Oh, look, yeah, the KKK, uh, Southern Alabamaners, about time they got their ass whooped. They're the only people fighting on behalf of you to have any rights. It's it. I want to, that's a perfect segue into further clarifying your point of view. And, and you've hinted at it in this conversation. You've hinted at it and talked about it in other conversations. This isn't an argument that racism doesn't exist and doesn't have an impact on society. This is an argument that you've identified the wrong level on which it has an impact on you and your life. Yes. The Bill Gateses, the Klaus Schwabs, the Rothschilds, the actual puppet masters and decision makers. Yes, I believe Racism controls part of their worldview. And they have the power to execute policies that have impact on your life. You're down here fighting at a level with people who have zero impact on your happiness, progress, anything. They may be an annoyance. Hey, they, they don't listen to your kind of music. And hey, they don't speak to you in the most respectful way, but you don't speak to them in the most respectful way either. You guys are equals and, you know, they are being just as exploited and just as sold out. They're going to be eating the exact same bugs and renting 1,000 square foot apartments just like you. And it's these guys at the top. And, 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 and yes, have they... The guys at the very top, the Rothschilds and those guys at the very top, are they comfortable with the Obamas and a few other people beneath them, but living well and the LeBrons and blah, 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 but they're going to be beneath them. And they're comfortable. Hey, in order for us to pull off our scam, there's a few of them we have to let in on the scam. And then there's going to be another level where 
Al Sharpton and all the people on TV that, that make a couple of million a year or maybe even 10 million like Stephen A a year. And then there's going to be everybody else. Yeah. And and it, it, it's anyway, I, I, I don't I don't I want you to go from there. No, let's go. No, let's go. Let's go deep. Let's just go all the way. Mon- Monday, uh, today's Monday, Tuesday, right? Tuesday. I'm sorry, I'm traveling today. Yes. The days escape me sometimes. Okay, Tuesday. Let's just go all the way. Oh, let's call this all the way Tuesday, okay? <laughs> Look, the craziest thing about it is in America, we are fighting what what started out as a scientific race war from the beginning, and now we're fighting it on both sides. Right. And I love I love seeing Alex Jones the other day come out and talk about how Nazism in Nuremberg, the Nazis defended themselves on trial by saying the real impulse towards our eugenics ideology came from British intelligence and was uh, uh, an offshoot of the social Darwinism and the Darwinism that came out of the crown's intellectual uh, you know, uh, education system for the most part, Sir Galton, right? Galton and Darwin and all of the, these people were British. And now all of a sudden not Nazism becomes the symbol of white supremacy. My whole point is that the whole technocratic scientific racism that has now morphed into liberal leftism in this infatuation or this acceptance of technology as a way to move forward into the future and save ourselves from from our fleshly demise, right? So you have this sort of leftist technocratic racism or anti-humanism, let's call it, right? Because again, go back to the fifth grade teachers. And I use them as an example because I think people can relate to this. When a white woman passes you through the fifth grade knowing you can't read, that's actually one of the highest forms of racism she can actually perform. Because what she's saying is, no matter how well I teach you, you just won't get it. Negro, your social circumstance, whatever combination that is, your your genetic predisposition, your, your nature versus whatever it is, It's so confounded and problematic. No matter how well I teach you, you just won't get it. That's racism. okay? and it happens on the left. Now, on the far right, we have this sort of militaristic and there really is still a a, a no Negroes, no Jews sort of thing happening over on the far, far, far right. But they're one in the same. Even posing them as left and right is a part of the scam. Okay, and let me tell you how ignorant and silly black people are. We actually believe that slave-taking culture began in Europe. No, 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 no. Your history's not good enough. No, the modern business model of drugs, piracy, and slavery that came from the crown is certainly prominent still today in America. Okay, it helped shape America. It helped shape capitalism. It helped shape the Western alliance of European nations. Yes. Okay. But slave taking and dehumanizing society or uh, hierarchical uh, corruption goes way, way back before post post enlightenment Europe. The Europeans weren't the first ones taking slaves. Who were the first ones taking slaves? The Chinese. And oh, by the way, for all of those who say that me and Bannon and Alex Jones and Trump and and whoever else are China hawks right now across the world, the CC, the, the, the European communists, the European Marxist intellectual movement has partnered together with the Communist Chinese Party and created a social global narrative that everybody needs to reject America and the American dollar on the basis of anti-colonialism. And right now, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are going all around the world and getting nations to dump their American dollars for the BRICS reconstructed economic global system like the Yuan because the Brazilians and the Russians and the Indians and the Chinese and South Africans are gonna be nicer to black folks. Are you people stupid? You people have no clue. You 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 haven't even be and you're at the HBCUs and you're at the the Essence Fest and, and you're at the you know the BET award show after party 
acting like you're coming together and, and, and you know, moving the needle and progressing forward. You're not even in the game. And they all know that those people aren't in the game, like the LeBrons and the D-Wades and the Gabriel Unions and the whatever other little Finocchio omnisexual cuck they can find. They're not even playing for real. The people like me, they will go out of their way to make sure that the algorithm never shows them the stuff we're talking about on this show because they know it's real and they know it's dangerous. And the Hebrew Israelites are the same and your Riza Islams are the same and your Kanye West are the same. Because even if we each have a little piece of it, when you put it together, it's one common theme. They're about to run a play on you Negroes. They're about to run a second slavery play on you Negroes. And now this time they're going to get you to embrace it. I can't tell you how angry it makes me to see African nations. African nations jump on board with the Chinese. The Chinese are the most, ra- the CCP in the Ch- is one of the most racist cultures in human history. Human history. Much, much older civilization than, than post-Enlightenment, post-Renaissance Europe, okay? Much, much older than, than that. There are, what's another very old slave-taking culture? The Egyptians. Yeah, oh, yeah, the Egyptians don't view themselves as Africa. All you neo, neophyte, pan-African, uh, the divine energy of the, of the, of the fourth chakra, of the, the shaman moon and all this BS, all this Egyptian yeah, hieroglyphs on your, on your social media and tattooing on your arms and all that. The Egyptians were the original slave-taking culture. They don't view themselves as black. The Egyptians don't even view themselves as African. They view themselves as Egyptian. They have their own identity. Where's our identity? What's the black identity in America? I'm sorry. I'm just ranting now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're bourgeois not. Bourgeois sellout ranting. Negroes. They, it, makes me, it, it makes me sick. These bourgeois Negroes make me sick. Uh, seriously, I'm sp- when I meet them, Jason, I'm spitting on the floor in front of them. Uh, you know, I'm spitting on the floor. I don't, I, you disgust me. You people disgust me because they know what they're doing. The bourgeois elite black folks, the ones that want to call you a coon, they know what they're doing. They signed the deal. They signed the dotted line. They know exactly who they're working for. What are the working average American uh, black people? What, 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 what do you get out of it? Go back to Ice Cube. I'm still seeing them say that Ice Cube's a sellout. What do you Negroes get out of the line city, the 15 minute city where you can't drive or buy anything without the government? Again, I'll say it again. Ricky Cobb was shot and killed recently here in Minneapolis, and I knew him first and foremost. And I think what they did was wrong. Secondly, but that's not really the point. The point is, why do you Negroes keep voting Democrat? You vote for the party that unequivocally expands the power of government. You give the government more money, you give them more power, you give them more right to do what they want to do to you. And you know what I come to realize? All these people that say they care about black people really don't even care about black people. They don't even care about themselves. It's all just a charade. That's the saddest part. When we talk about a pro-black movement, there really isn't a pro-black movement. It's all theater. Because there's no way you black folks can justify giving the Democrat Party your support, which then gives the government ever-expanding power to be tyrannical against you and then say that you're anti-police. It doesn't add up. You Negroes are running around like chickens with your head cut off, and then you want to call me a sellout. Or then you want to say, I'm too deep or intellectual. Oh, it ain't that deep. It ain't that deep. Okay. Well, Royce, what they want to keep it in the shallow end of the pool because, again, their scheme is that's working very effectively is, hey, the Democrats are going to protect me from the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the white landscaper that doesn't like my music. And, you know, we argued over a parking spot outside of Walmart. And so I'm voting Democrat. And again, this the thinking is so small and is at such a childlike level and childlike understand for particularly for people that are calling themselves woke and, and to sit around and think. And again, that, that people can't follow me. I, I get it. But 
when I looked at those working class people on January 6th, not the Fed that were planted, but the working class people on January 6th that went to go confront these corrupt politicians who are selling us all out, Mm -hmm. And and somehow we got a game run on us where we think, oh, yeah, th- that was a white supremacist resur- insurrection. And and oh, and, and I'm t- there's going to be stories coming out, I think. And I, I want to be careful here. I don't want to. But there's going to be stories coming out that are going to further prove how Jussie Smollett this whole story was about January 6th and how many of the people that testified, some of the police officers that testified and went on TV and said X, Y, and Z, it's mm-hmm. going to get exposed through the video because Tucker only got to put out a little tiny piece of the video that demonstrated like, wow, this whole thing was a lie. And so some of the main television stars you saw from that are going to be contradicted with video that show, wow, a cop said this, this, and this happened to him? Well, here's the video, and none of it happened. It, it, it's, but I'm just telling you, I, and I want to say to white conservatives that watched the Montgomery deal, that young boy that hopped in the water and swam, we should be licking our chops like, man, that's who we need on our team. That dude has Man. heart. Man. All he needs is the information. If we get the right information to him, he's got heart and conviction and courage. And and so I would see an opportunity in what they call Aquaman or a black Aquaman or a scuba gooding junior. He get that young man the right information. He's got a pair. And get some of these other guys that were out of control and, and went too far, but they got heart. They just need the right information and, and need to be waking up to like, no, 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 no. I, these two white drunk idiots, yeah, I, I get it, but trust me, you got them in your family too. And and <laughs> you know, you could get in a scrap with a security guard just like them and go too far and blah, blah, blah. But if we could take that energy and provide them with the right information, then we got something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, the the number one, look, 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 this is why our show, this is why Fearless is the best conversation. And we're not trying to drift over to one side or the other so that we can uh, amass all the following from that side so they can buy products from us. There's a lot of people out there doing that. Fox News is one of them. They're doing that. And, and, and so the, you tune in, you'll see their narrative is way one way. You tune in to Sean King or, or Don Lemon, you know, formerly Don Lemon. Uh, it, their narrative is another way. Let's just get down to what it really is. On the Republican side, on the conservative movement, there is a contingency that would much rather lose elections and give the country over to China we call them rhinos, they're really Democrats, they would gladly give the country over to China for a piece of the action as long as they could keep black people out of the party. In fact, they're not even really racist. They'll just pretend to be racist if it can achieve the goal of keeping black people out of the party so that the Republican Party never becomes a real party of the people, right? That's how deep the corruption goes. Okay, a lot of these Republicans over here, they're not even, they're not even, they're not racist. They're LARPing as racists. They've been put there by the security state. Let, let me tell you how deep it goes. Three committee men. The Republican Party in Minnesota has three RNC committee men. Two of them are former military. So they got cover, right? Because they're a veteran. They served the country. But really, they just as likely could be military intelligence, right? And when you have that many officers of the military, like a January 6th, you can send them out on missions that are decompartmentalized, right? This is how you run a, 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 a worldwide scam with a very few people because they're in on the game. We're just sitting here blind. Why is it that a, that a RNC committee man in the Republican Party would have a young political talent like me, Royce White, come up and try and get black people to, to view the Republican Party as an option and go around the Republican Party to the other white people 
in the party, which is mostly white. Don't get me wrong. The Republican Party here in Minnesota is four fifths white, if not five, six, not nine point five tenths white. OK, but there's a few black people who are waking up trying to get in the game. Why would you go around to the other white folks and say Royce is a physical danger to Republicans? Former military guy. They don't want black people in the party. They, the, the status quo is what they're trying to protect. The narrative is what they're using to protect it. OK, what they don't want are patriots, MAGA patriots and black militants hitting the streets and hitting the streets together. That's why you see the mainstream media criticize BLM from the right. And you see the mainstream media on the left criticize MAGA from the left. The whole thing is to condemn any type of civil civil action. Can you imagine if the black militant men around this country joined hands with the MAGA conservatives and hit the streets to protest this nuclear war that we're going to have with Russia, to protest sending our jobs to China, to protest outsourcing our jobs to technology, to protest the expansion of government and the illegal and unconstitutional taxation of the working man. Can you imagine if that happened? The security state can, the intelligence community can, and that's what they've been put there to protect. Not you. They're not protecting you white folks from from turban wearing terrorists in the Middle East. They were never protecting you from that. They run those people. Who gave Osama bin Laden his start? Who went to the Mujahideen and asked them for uh, to, to help fight the Iraqis in the Kuwait war? It's history. It's just, it's right there. It ain't, you ain't gotta go far. We, Osama bin, matter of fact, let's go the other way, Jason. Osama bin Laden came to us, <laughs> Saudi royal. Why? Because the Saudis aren't really Muslims. They're minos. They're Muslims in name only. They're only interested in what they're interested in, them, right? The whole Muslim war with them in Iraq is just a political war. It's not a spiritual battle, okay? Osama came to us and asked us, would we fund him to help fight off Saddam in Kuwait? Why? Why do you think he came to us? Because we weren't, he was we. He wasn't the first one to get American dollars to run some religious, holy, terrorist type scam in the Middle East in the interest of oil and energy. We are in an energy game. The game is about energy now. People have to understand what's happening. All of the social politics is meant to keep you distracted from the real game is about energy the consumption and production of energy and a few aristocratic elites thinking they know where energy is best spent because they're smarter than you. They're, they're, they're more valuable than you. Their life means more than yours. That's where we're at now. If a bunch of hillbillies and black folks with their pants sagging want to fight each other uh, while, while these elites start, you know, putting chips in a, 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 a Mystery meat. Now, now they're now they're cloning meat and putting it in restaurants without your consent. Who knows what they're putting in that meat? You talking about a pandemic coming, another pandemic coming. I see black people. I'm sorry, Jason. This is go all the way Tuesday. We might have to rename it. Go all the way Tuesday. I still see black people wearing masks. Why are you black people still wearing masks? You're scared of the next pandemic, but you're going to eat mystery meat in some boutique artisan cafe in San Francisco from some celebrity chef that gets cloned meat now. And he's progressive and he's environmental friendly. He's an ally. You people. Look, you can do you can follow. I'm not going with you. Sorry. Royce, awesome job. We'll see you later this week. Thank you so much. All right, guys, are you ready to boost your testosterone and get your old self back? Our sponsor, Nugenix Total Teeds, offering a complimentary bottle when you text 231231 and enter the keyword fearless. Are you really ready to lose your shape, your muscle, your energy? As men age, we lose free testosterone, the man hormone. We lose that fire. It's harder to feel as alive and as energetic, be as active. It's even harder to stay in shape. Now you can get back that old fire back with Nugenix. Want more energy, more power to fight the negative physical effects of aging? Nugenix Total T Testosterone Booster with Testafin will help you turn back the clock and re-energize your life. 
It'll help you look and feel like the man you want to be. And now get a complimentary bottle when you text 231231 and enter the keyword fearless. This is the unprecedented formula with science-backed key ingredients to safely maximize your free and total testosterone levels, help you increase muscle mass, and skyrocket your performance as you age. Nugenics is also the number one doctor-recommended testosterone-boosting brand. If you're not totally satisfied, Nugenics will refund 100% of your purchase price plus shipping and processing. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text 231231 and enter the keyword FEARLESS. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermal X, our newest and most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you lose fast and get lean fast absolutely free. 231231, enter the keyword fearless. 231231, enter the keyword fearless. Texting enrolls you in to reoccurring automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. The number one doctor recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. I'd say right, tuned on going with your favorite part of the show, Steve Kim next. All right, welcome back. Time for some Korean co-sell. Steve Kim, your favorite part of the show, a part of the show I tolerate because you like it. Uh, Steve, uh, Kevin Brown, the Baltimore Orioles broadcaster, has been suspended and or fired, or suspended, I think, for stating facts <laughs> about the team. And the reason why I find this interesting is because this is where we're headed in the media, that broadcasters now have no freedom and they're just there to spread propaganda and do commercials about the team and you can't go anywhere near the truth about a team. Let's watch Michael Kay talking about the Kevin Brown suspension for mentioning that the team is, you know, losing a lot of games. Here's Michael Kay. And if it is true, and I, I'm going to choose to believe it's true, they should be ashamed of themselves because not only was what Kevin said in the Oriole notes that night, but it was on a graphic which means that it was planned. So if you're going to be so thin-skinned to suspend Kevin Brown, then you have to suspend the entire Oriole truck, the producer, director, graphics. You have to suspend all of them because they're all complicit in this. And if John Angelos, the owner of the Orioles, didn't like that, that he's thin-skinned, he's unreasonable, and he should actually get a call from Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, because it's unconscionable that you would actually suspend a really good broadcaster for no reason whatsoever. He didn't do anything wrong. And you know that music that starts playing in the cut that you played, Peter? That yeah. means a graphic has come up. So the graphic had already been printed out, and you said this earlier. This is not how it works. Kevin Brown doesn't say it, and somebody who's running graphics in the truck could put together a graphic in two seconds. That's that's put together an hour before that happens. And you're going to suspend this guy for saying that, which wasn't even negative. Again, then everybody in the Oriole PR department has to be suspended. It was in their notes. That very thing was in their notes. This makes the Orioles look so small and insignificant and minor league. And, of course, they don't comment on personnel matters. And they didn't say they fired the guy. They suspended him. But can you imagine how that guy must feel? He has to keep his mouth shut. He can't criticize the Orioles because they don't get fired. So, of course, we look forward to Kevin coming back. But you embarrassed the guy for no reason. And, most importantly, you embarrassed yourself. What you did is disgraceful to the business. Disgraceful. Mm, mm, mm. Steve, uh, your thoughts on where we're at in broadcasting. Well, first of all, when I saw the story on Twitter, I said, okay, this is interesting. White guy gets suspended for what he said, so I'm thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh. And, and I'm thinking, I'm not going to lie to you, Jason. I was like, did he go to that museum? You know which museum I'm talking about. <laughs> did he go to that museum? The Negro and, Leagues Museum, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you said it, not me. 
the museum. And then I saw the thing. And I'm like, wow, this is Orwellian. And it reminds me of a story that Chick Hearn uh, once talked about years ago. And this is during the early days of the Lakers in Los Angeles when they were still owned by Jack Ken Cook, certainly a control freak, very temperamental. He calls Chick Hearn into the office and they start playing the recording of the previous game. It's a game where the Lakers were getting blown out. And Kent Cook says to Chick, you know, I counted in this game. You said 43 good things about the Washington Bullets and only 16 about the Lakers. And I guess Chick Hearn had some power or some guts. And he said, well, sir, we were getting blown out by 18. What did you want me to say? Chick Hearn never got called into the office again. <laughs> Jack Ken Cook actually said, you know what? Point taken. As much as he didn't like it, I think he understood. I get it. And it is a different time. And I, I feel bad for the guy. I think everyone does. And I would hope that he doesn't lose his job. But you're absolutely right. Look, think about this, Jason. If you are not allowed to state facts about a team, where do you think these announcers have to stand on social issues when they're brought up when it comes to the, these fad hashtags. I mean, think about it. If you literally cannot talk about how we've struggled on the road against this team, when it comes to the next social justice movement or political issue, these guys all have to fall in lockstep or quite frankly, they may be out of a job. Steve, just, just think about this as it relates to, things going on at ESPN. ESPN's talking about partnering with the NFL or NBA. Mm -hmm. ESPN mm -hmm. just ran off its very good NBA broadcasting team of Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson. Yeah. And part of the reason Jeff Van Gundy was the first one out the door is because he's critical of officiating. The NBA yeah. doesn't want that. And so they're silencing dissent. If you can get fired for stating facts about the team, if you can't question, criticize, officiating, and you can get, and, and, and again, I've said it multiple times, I like Doris Burke. She's not going to criticize anybody in the NBA, not in a real way, it's just not her thing. And so the whole system is moving towards pro all propaganda. And just yeah. all team, they're all just going to be public relations teams on air. And approved messaging. You know, last couple of days on my timeline, I saw some old clips of Merrill Hodge. And, you know, obviously it's had some health issues, but there's a theory that one of the reasons why Merrill is no longer at ESPN, he was too blunt. And, and there's some classic clips of him where he went against the grain. And when it came to the NFL draft, he would flat out say, Jadavion Clowney, nope, not a number one pick. And everyone was aghast because everyone thought Jadavion was going to be the next Richard Dent. But he said, nope, pad level's too high. He does not physical. He's not aggressive. And if you get in his face, he backs down. I like Khalil Mack. And it's almost like, you, you're right, you honestly cannot give that opinion because Jadavion Clowney was like this glorified figure. And so everyone has to praise him for whatever reason. Okay. But Merrill Hodge just said, no, I just looked at the tape and as a football guy, don't like him. And guess what? He was right. Problem with Merrill is I think he was right too often, but he went against the grain. He had a lot of guts. And I don't know if there is room for that anymore. Like I saw the uh, coverage this year of Anthony Richardson prior to the draft. Now, what is the mantra when it comes to the combine? Combine doesn't matter. It's all about game tape. We don't care about the combine. It's all about the game tape. Never mind what he runs, what he benches, three shuttle, cone drills, anything. But when it came to Anthony Richardson, it was all about, man, phys did you see the way he dominated the combine? Never mind the kid, the young man threw for 53% in college. Think about that. You throw for 53% in college with those rules and the way the game is, but no one would bring that up. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, what happened to the game tape? Because I don't think any of these guys wanted the blowback. Maybe even more than that, maybe it was not allowed. Now, Anthony Richardson can prove a lot of people wrong, and I guess he's having an impressive camp throwing against there for the Colts. I'm interested to see if he struggles early on, what will the narrative be and what are the pundits willing to say if he does not get off to a great start? Steve, I'm going to tell you, and people aren't ready for this conversation, 
but it, it, we'll, we'll have it all throughout uh, this upcoming season. And we had a little bit of it last season, but I'm going to hammer this narrative. The, the, the NFL has so watered down the rules. I think it's hard for quarterbacks to fail. You have yeah. to be really, really bad, lazy, yes. drug problem, drinking problem, carousing problem. They've put training wheels on the quarterback position, and anybody can play the position. And it doesn't matter about your mechanics. If you can stay healthy and you don't have some drinking or drug problem, you'll have a modicum of success playing NFL quarterback. The position just isn't nearly as hard as it used to be. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Is this Jason Whitlock or Coach Jason Brown I'm on with? Hold on. Wait a minute. Oh, it's you. It's you, Jay. <laughs> wow. You went all – and by the way, I, I agree with you. In, in the age of the bubble screen, the pop pass, the shovel pass, uh, defenders not being able to hit people across the middle. You know, Jason, I watch games. You know, a lot of the uh, SEC network, NFL network, they're replaying old games. And – I'm a sicko. I actually watch and enjoy a lot of it. To see some of these games from even, let's say, 2010, a couple weeks ago on a Sunday, they showed South Carolina upsetting Alabama in 2010. It was one of the biggest victories in Gamecocks history. The level of violence and the physicality in that game, it's almost like a different sport to now. Um, and so now you cannot reroute defenders coming over the middle you no longer have to have your head on a swivel because now you get a step and a half to actually look for defenders. And, and the way the game is played now, where it's a glorified seven-on-seven seven to a large degree, also the hits the quarterbacks take. You know, they, they have the whole body weight rule now, the Tony Saragusa, Rich Gannon rule. Well, you know, that really wasn't all that implemented until the last five, six years. So the game has definitely changed, and yes, they have eased it for the quarterbacks. But Jason, going real quickly back to the announcing real quickly there used to be a time that you could be identified with the team I don't want to use the term homer but guys like Hawk Harrelson and, and Harry Carey they were great because unlike Vince Scully who was very much down the middle they identified with the team they were a part of the team they were a part of the city but they were allowed to be critical and it was great uh, it's really a shame now that these guys are now getting their vocal cords cut out from underneath them. Steve, a topic you brought up this morning that I'm glad you did. It's great. Uh, some comments Ron Rivera mm -hmm. has made about Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator uh, for the Washington Commanders now, uh, the greatest black coach in the history of the NFL, according to all the pundits. He, worked under Andy Reid and devised that entire Andy Reid offense that won the Chiefs two Super Bowls. Now he's an offensive coordinator with the Washington Commanders. And I find it very interesting that Ron Rivera shared with the media this week that uh, some of the Washington Commander players have come to Ron Rivera and say, hey man, what's up with uh, Eric Bieniemy, what 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 what's going? He's too intense. He's too in your face. And these are Commanders players. And Ron then asked the players, "Hey, you know, go sit down with Eric and try to work it out." And blah blah blah. I find it fascinating that Ron Rivera shared mm -hmm. this information that. Eric Bieniemy's off to a bit of a rough start, and I'm sure Ron tried to put a positive spin on it, but there's no reason to share this information unless there are already problems and Ron Rivera is trying to dominate the narrative off the top. Because mm -hmm. if the Reds, if the commanders struggle, there's going to be the media saying, you know, they should fire Ron Rivera and make Eric Bieniemy the head coach. And, and that could be halfway through the season, that could be four games into the season, and Ron Rivera has now entered into the narrative like, hey, these offensive players ain't even really on board with Eric Bieniemy. Don't come rushing in here to have him replace me. Jason, um, to paraphrase the great Chris Berman, this shows right here that Riverboat Ron was never wanting to sleep be with Bieniemy. 
Uh, this shows me right there this was never his guy. This was forced upon him, and this was like a social justice move that, okay, I'll take the enemy. I'll be the good guy. I'll get social credit points. And But shame on Ron. He's got to be a football coach, and I think his statement should have been to those players, tough, deal with it. It's football. It's a tough game. This is the coach you have. We'll all have to make this work, bottom line. Honestly, I'm actually disappointed in Rivera. If, regardless if that was your number one choice or not, you have to at least early on, before a snap is took, you got to tell these players, yeah, toughen up. This is football. Everyone knew what they were getting with Eric Bieniemy. Because if you go back all the way to his days as a running back coach, and I've seen the footage, he did not care that Adrian Peterson may have been the best football player in the world. He coached him hard. I respected that. Because he was not going to allow an all-time great talent to ever underachieve, and they had a combative relationship. No matter what you want to think about his acumen on the chalkboard with the X's and O's, I really do like that about Coach Bieniemy, that he is old-school football. And the other thing that gets me, and you talk about this a lot, I, I have a question about those players that went to complain to Coach Rivera. I would love to know, were they the white guys or the black players? I thought the black players wanted leadership that looked more like them. So my view is, if it is black players, shame on you guys, because you guys have to make this work. Because don't you want more opportunities for coaches of your skin tone? Isn't that the big word? Or does that not apply now if the guy screams too much? I don't think black players have been leading the push, not in a real way, for black coaches. Former black players have been leading that push, sitting around talking on ESPN. But the current ones... They want guys that can help them put up numbers, win games, and get big contracts. That's all they care about. Yeah. Care less what color the coach is. Can he design an offense that will allow me to put up numbers and get a big contract and win games? And so I'm not surprised if you look at his history with Travis Kelsey, look at his history with Patrick Mahomes. Listen, Eric Bieniemy, I think, is a terrific position coach in the mm. NFL. Old school guy, going to be hard on a player. Perfect, great coach for a Adrian Peterson. He's been promoted, in my view, beyond his competence level to offensive coordinator. He rode uh, Andy Reid's coattails and the media narrative campaign, the, the racial uh, grievance industry to being the greatest offensive coordinator in the history and must be named a head coach. And, and to, we haven't even gotten out of his first training camp with a new organization, and there's already <laughs> problems. I'm not surprised. I, 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 I don't expect this to go well. I've been skeptical of the whole thing. He's a media creation. I'm not trying to beat up on him. He's a position coach in the NFL. He got to hold that clipboard and pretend to be the offensive coordinator in Kansas City for three, four years or whatever. The media used him to look how virtue signal and look how tough I am on the racist NFL. And now the Washington Commanders are going to have to deal with the reality of Eric Bieniemy, and and it's a he's a position coach that is operating as offensive coordinator, and and I would tend to suspect. Ron Rivera sees like, whoa, yeah. I got a running back coach running my offense, and, and there's more pressure now on whoever the quarterback's coach is to help with the offense. And, and to, to, to think, <laughs> they haven't made it through the first training camp. No, We're no, just no, no, a Jason. few days. We're not even halfway through training camp, and Jason. it's already an issue. Jason, we're not even to the first exhibition game. Think of, no, Jason, we're not even, forget first camp. Jason, they haven't even kicked off the first exhibition game. I'm so, let's fast forward seven, eight weeks. It's like week four and five. And let's say these, what are they, what are they called now? The commanders, okay. Let's say they're averaging 16 points a game. What do you think the mood in that locker room or those offensive meetings is going to be like? This, this really reminds me a lot of when Luke Walton took over for the Lakers about, what, seven, eight years ago. All right, so the Golden State Warriors begin this great run. Lakers are struggling. We're kind of into the abyss post-Kobe. 
And I'll never forget, everyone was so excited because Luke Walton, former Laker, won championships with our organization, had come back. And everyone's excited because he's in that warrior system and he learned. And I, and I, and I was like, I was like, I had to be me. I was like, hey, guys, I, I got a question. I, I like Luke. Love his father. Good Laker. Um, is he bringing Steph and Clay with them? Because <laughs> if not, we are still a bad. Guess what? Luke was not as smart without those two guys. It was amazing. So I, I would get – I'm just going to make an assumption here. Without Kelsey and Mahomes, the offensive IQ of Eric Bien, I mean, it also dips 100 points without him, them. Steve, we're in total agreement. Going to let you go. Thank you so much. Great job as always. Uh, we'll play some tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow.